Hello there, people of the internet. My name is Uduru Jagero and this is Dialogues with Jagero. Welcome to 2024. Happy New Year. And I hope this new year brings you love, brings you joy, brings you more wealth. Now, today I'm having a guest, but first let me tell you this. We have always heard that about billionaires and we wonder how do they live? What kind of life, lifestyle do they actually live? You know, I have seen them in the movies. You've seen them in the movies in a penthouse you know, sipping vodka at 8 a.m. in the morning, having AIDS milling around, having a great time. So let me confess, I am not a billionaire, but I have one in the house today. Mr. Steve Sarowitz, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Welcome to Kenya, the land of honey and milk. I want to tell you how much I love Kenya. Yeah. And I love Kenyans. I've been, I was told before I got to Africa that Africans were more spiritual than Americans, and that's definitely the case. Mm. But I've been stunned by the generosity and love and gentleness and kindness of Kenyans. Just pleasantly, I, I had it was almost like you, know, you rarely go someplace with high expectations yeah. and have them exceeded. But my expectations have been more than exceeded. Mm, what 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 is good about a Kenyan? They're open, friendly, um, faithful. Uh, it's a it's a seems like a very cheerful. And gentle. There's a gentleness mm. and gentleness and kindness, which I love about Kenyans. Mm. You told me that when we had uh, a discussion of familiarity meeting the other day that uh, this is your first time in Kenya, right? First time in Africa. Mm. Taking you so long to come. I'm just slow at everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, there is this joke that the poor, the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. You've heard about it? I have. Mm. It's true. Hmm. And I don't like it. And I'm working myself to change that. As a rich person, I'm uh, planning on, I, I've said this very publicly, I'm giving away the majority of my wealth. Mm. So I've said in the next 15 years, actually well before then, I won't be a billionaire anymore. Mm. I'm giving away money at a fairly rapid rate. And at, at some point in time, I will no longer be a billionaire. And at yeah. some point in time, I will no longer even be that rich. And that's fine with me. I don't. Mm. I, dry, I don't sip vodka at 8 in the morning. I, in fact, I don't drink at all. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I drive a Prius. Um, mm. I'm not you, a fan. You drive a what? A uh, Toyota Prius. Mm. Not a Mercedes? Maybach? Nope. Nope. No, no, no. But you can afford it. I could, yeah. You know? I, I just don't care about material things. It's not mm. my... It's not I expected you to have an Apple watch, but you've got a strange watch, bro. <laughs> what, what watch is this? It's a Timex. Yeah? It's a $30 watch. Hmm. That's what I, I just, that's who I am. This is me. I'm wearing a t-shirt. That's who I am. My, my, my money is invested. I do a lot of impact investing. I do a lot of philanthropy. Mm. What I want to do is make the world a better place. And that's yeah. what money's for. Money should be for the service of the world. Mm. And if more rich people said that, uh, then we would have a better world. You know, the money, the, the resources are there. We need to share those resources. We need to apply those resources. Now, before I go any further, I will tell you, please don't call me and ask for money because I'm not going to give it to you. Mm. What I do, all of my money is given away through nonprofits. And I do it very carefully because I want to make sure that every dollar I give away has the maximum benefit. Yeah. And I do it, I do it through my foundation. Yeah. Let's get, let's get to, to, the, to who you are. I, when, I was, when I was introducing you, I did not introduce the businesses that you do. I wanted you to... Uh, so sort of, first of all, the studio that you run is so difficult I can't pronounce it. Wayfarer, I so that's good. You I, got it. <laughs> Wayfarer. Yeah, you got it. That's it. Ah, so I wanted I wanted you to talk to us about how you were brought up, where you where you were born, how how you grew up, probably your schooling, and then uh, into the business that you know in Africa when you ask a billionaire how he got their wealth. It's a very it's a very difficult conversation to have. I was born in uh, New York, outside of New York City. Lived in New Jersey for seven years, and then I moved to the Chicago area. I grew up middle class. My dad's an engineer. My mom later in life became a psychologist. Uh, we never really had a lot. We we had enough, but we weren't wealthy. Um, we were comfortable, and uh, so I never lacked for anything. But it, we, you know, we we drove for our vacations. We didn't fly. Uh, we didn't stay in fancy hotels. Uh, my parents never drove fancy cars. We we just didn't. My parents didn't have a lot, but they had enough. They they had enough for me to go to college. College was very cheap then, uh, so I, I lived a, a comfortable life, but you know, kind of a middle class life. And 
After I got out of college, I wanted to start a business. My parents gave me $1,000. Uh, I called them up six months later and said, you know, that thousand dollars you gave me, I've lost that and I've lost fifteen hundred dollars more besides. So I had to get my uh, what were you doing with that thousand dollars? I went and started a painting business and I also did a food fair and I went around the country selling a uh, Pope USA tour T-shirts. Mm. Um, that's a whole story, which uh, it would take up the whole podcast. But to, I'll just say that I ended up in uh, jail in Pontiac, Michigan for selling T-shirts without a permit. Wow. <laughs> It was um, it was a fun ride. I was 21 years old. Uh, I uh, then went in, got a job uh, selling. My first job was selling copiers. My third job was working for a payroll company, um, and I did that for a few years. And then I quit and started the Chinese restaurant. I lost everything I had, and uh, so by the time I was 29 years old, I had a net worth of zero. I don't know if you can count that high. It's a pretty high number. You were, you had nothing. I had literally you nothing. nothing. I had nothing. I had earned all the money. I, I, I basically gotten up to zero because I'd lost money on the Chinese restaurant. So by the by the time I was 29, I'd gotten back up to zero. Yeah. But I had a very good job. I'd gotten back in the payroll business. I was a sales manager, then a director of sales in, in payroll. And I, and I didn't spend a lot of money, so I saved pretty much everything I made. I got married. And in, when I was 31, I started a little company which is now known as Paylocity. Its, it's original name was Ameripay. And uh, we built it up, and I just built it up one client at a time. Uh, in 2014, we became we went public, and I, I owned, the day we went public, I owned 51% of the company. I own a lot less now, but I still, according to Forbes, my net worth is over $2 billion. And it has to do with the 2. company. 2.4, exactly. Yeah, that's what Forbes says. So yeah, I, guess I, I converted into Kenya shillings. It's $400 <laughs> billion. Okay, so a four hundred billion in Kenya. Can- <laughs> it's probably a little high because I've given away money that Forbes hasn't accounted for, mm. and uh, it will go down. My net worth will go down, mm. and I will just continue to give give it away to. Uh, that's that's interesting. I want to go back a little bit to your your losing streak. You lost a thousand dollars. You lost a thousand five hundred dollars. I lost twenty five hundred dollars. I lost a thousand. My parents gave me plus fifteen hundred dollars more besides. Yeah, and then you started a Chinese company, and then it flopped. Yes. Mm. Looking back, if you were taken back to the $1,000, would you still have lost? Oh, yeah. What does that tell us about running a business? It's risky. Um, You know, the most successful entrepreneurs like me have had failures. You learn from your failures. Um, and, And entrepreneurs, our personality, we tend to iterate through life. We do something wrong. So the person I hired to run my business, one of the reasons I'm so successful is I hired a who are now co-CEO, Steve Beauchamp, in 2007. And when I hired him, we were doing $20 million in revenue. Today, we're projected this year at $1.4 billion. And he's a great professional manager. And I, I remember when I hired him, I asked everyone who was working for me. I, well, I went and apologized. I said, I'm sorry, I hired someone else. You're now going to be reporting to him. And they all thanked me. And that's when I realized I wasn't a very good manager. But uh, I'm a very good entrepreneur. I'm very good at iterating. And, and so an, an entrepreneur... You can think of them like a speedboat, and and then you have to change place and change your direction very quickly. An entrepreneur does that. And sometimes you do it the wrong way, and you fail, but then you get back up. Someone who's a professional manager like Steve takes a bigger ship and and, and, and guides it, and you have to think more carefully and, and make decisions a little bit more slowly. You don't necessarily have that luxury when you're starting a business. So Steve would tell you that I'm a better entrepreneur than him. And I would tell you that he's so much better a manager that I couldn't even call myself. I'm, I've gotten better over the years, but I'm not great at managing people. It's not and, my and forte. And that is that is that is something that is that is that is a pain point for a lot of businesses. But then the question is then how how do we attribute the the money to you? You know, for example, you, who, who then built Pelocity? Is it you or him? Yes. Who? Both of us. Both of you. Yeah, I mean, it's both of us, and he's done very well. I mean, he I don't think he'd complain. He's done very well. But um, I built it for the first 10 years without him, and I built it with a lot of other people. And, you know, one person doesn't build a business. I was the head of the business, and I worked very hard. I, I was at Paylocity for the first 17 years of its existence. I think if I do that right. And then I, then now I'm just on the board. So I helped build Paylocity. There's no question that I helped build Paylocity. Mm-hmm. But a lot of other people did too. I happen to be the founder of Paylocity, and I took the risk when it first started, and, and I've been rewarded very well for that. Um, but it, there's no question that Paylocity wouldn't be Paylocity today without Steve Beauchamp and, 
mm-hmm. and Toby, who is co-CEO, and, and Mike Caskey is no longer there, but was there for many years running sales and was president. We have a lot of people that have contributed. Jennifer Page was our head of operations for 20 years. And she, you know, so there's a lot of other people who've, who built Paylocity besides me. Yeah, uh, the other day I was discussing with, uh, with, with one of my, uh, you know, people that are helping with the podcast about, you know, if, if, do you think that when you have, you have a lot of money, for example, you have, you have 100 million to start a business and, uh, you have, and another person has just 50 million to start the business. She was telling me that money is not the number one. No. But I thought it was. I started, I started Paylocity with $70,000. And I remember, I, this is actually a pretty good story. I had a couple of friends of mine, one who I just talked to the other day, actually called me for his spiritual journey, which we have to talk about later. Yeah. Um, you know, he's it's actually selling his business. He's going to have all the money he needs. And he says, I'm, but I'm having a spiritual crisis. I said, and he said, you're the first person I thought of. But anyway, years ago, we both had payroll businesses. His business was twice as big as mine. And I, in fact, there were three other businesses, I think, two or three other businesses that wanted to combine with mine, and we were all going to throw in the pot. And I would have ended up with the smallest piece. And I said, absolutely no way, because I knew at that time that my forte was technology. I knew that I was better at technology by far than any other businesses. And, and so that's what made Paylocity. That was the engine that made Paylocity grow. It's not, you can give someone who's not, who can't run a business $50 million, and they'll eventually run through it, or $100 million. And I saw that happen uh, many years ago in America during the dot-com bubble. There were companies that said, hey, I've got $20 million, and then the next year they're out of business. You need to know how to run the business. And you know it's much more important that you actually, you, know, you can start with nothing and build it up. It's not easy to do that. Of course, look, the best scenario is if you have lots of funding and you know what you're doing. But in lieu of that, I'll take someone who knows what they're doing over someone who has a lot of money. How do you get the people that work for you? Well, I'd love to tell you I'm perfect at hiring people, and I've never hired a bad apple. I've hired so many bad apples. Um, and, you know, maybe there's someone else's good apple, but they're just not a fit. I've hired a lot of people who weren't a fit. Um, the key thing is to hire slowly and fire quickly. When I was younger, I remember one person who was running a key area. He was actually one of, uh, when we were very new, one, he was one of three key managers I had. And... Uh, the other two managers, or other two people who were running the company with me, said, they came to me one day and said, he has to go or we go. And I should have fired him six months earlier, but I, I hadn't because I was afraid of losing him and what, you know, I'm never going to be able to replace him. If, if it's not working out, you go to this person right away and say it's not working out. You know, you give people a chance, but I think you have to find your team. And the best way to do it is to interview well and to learn how to really focus on 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 getting people who share your values. I think uh, capabilities are important, but values, we sometimes forget values. And some of the worst hires, I can think of one of the worst hires I I ever made. He was very smart in math, and I was so taken with that, I said, hire him. But he didn't share any of the values of the company, and he was really a disaster in the long run. Yeah, but some people say that why, if you, if you, if they keep firing him, then who is going to hire him? He has to give to, to be better as their job. So how do you how do you balance it? Do you for example you can you can see clearly that this person is not doing this this job well, but he wants to learn. Do you keep the person that wants to learn? Yes. Uh-huh. If, if if they're showing progress and they're not doing great damage to the company, absolutely. I have one employee that I called her into my office one day. This is many years ago. Um, and we were a very new company and she was very young. She was in her twenties. And we had a company picnic and she being uh, uh, an obnoxious 20-some-year-old scheduled her own picnic with her friends that day just to just to be nasty to the company. So I called her in my office, and she was in tears by the time we're done. And uh, I didn't fire her. I just told her never to do that again, and I explained to her what I thought of it. This, this young woman uh, has performed amazingly well for the company, and she's still there 20 years later. Yeah. She's no longer that young anymore. She's, but she, she did, she's done a great job. But she needed to hear that this is the wrong thing to do. I have no problem if somebody makes a mistake. I have a problem if someone is not willing to learn from their mistakes or is incapable of doing the job. Okay. Uh, a lot of people are saying that, you know, um, what are some of the things that you start with properly? For example, the foundations. If you want to have a, uh, a billion-dollar business, 
<laughs> what are the what are the foundation? What are the things that you need to get right? I, I remember when we were talking before that, you told me that you know you just make you just make mistake along the way. But now looking back, because now you, you it's very difficult for you to it will take some time for you you know a miracle for you to make a mistake. But what are looking back now? What are some of the things that if you want to grow a big huge business, what are some of the things that you should set as a foundation? Well, you should have a business which is solid from the start. Uh, number one, don't spend. A lot of businesses want to be fancy and they want to spend a lot of money. Conserve your money. A small business is like a baby. It needs to conserve its money. Work hard. Focus on the core elements of the business. Um, there was a company when I first started that hired about five salespeople, and I didn't hire anybody. I, I wanted to make sure my first clients were very happy. So you build the business on happy clients, happy employees and happy clients. That was what I always did. And stick to the fundamentals. And don't worry about building that business overnight. My business is now a 26-year, 27-year as of this year, overnight success. It, you know, we built year after year. After one year, this company that had five salespeople had 300 clients. I had 100 clients, and they looked at me and they laughed. Two or three years later, we were, they were out of business they, because what they hadn't done is built their operations. So always stick to your values. Make your clients very happy, and your clients build your business for you in my type of business. Um, and study, you know, don't, again, I, I think it's much, important that, much more important to have substance as opposed to trying to be the best salesperson. Yes, you need to market your business. Actually, Paylocity, ironically, is getting better at marketing, but that's never been our forte. We're kind of a quiet company, but what we've done is just built the best mid-market payroll company in the United States, and now worldwide, actually. Let's talk about Paylocity now. Okay. Because um, I read about it, and I realized that it's a very big industry, like bigger than I thought. Mm -hmm. And I saw that you're doing HR management, you're doing, um, you are, you are managing employees, you're managing the payroll it's, uh, itself. You talked about uh, payroll management, and then you say, talked about, uh, on your website that is also global payroll. I didn't understand the, the difference between the two. So um, Paylossi started as a domestic payroll company. Yeah. And then when I was 46, this is going back uh, 12 years ago, because I'm now 58, I, I, went, I turned to Steve Beauchamp, our, our CEO, and I said, you know, you've taken over my job. You're better than I ever was. I'm doing nothing. I don't have anything to do. I can just retire and go to the beach. But I'm, I'm kind of young. I'm in good shape. What can I do? He said, well, nobody does global payroll well. So I started a company called Blue Marble Payroll. After five years, I came to Steve, or we, we talk all the time. I said, well, he said, how's your business going? I said, well, we're doing a million and a half years, a million and a half a year in revenue, and we have six million in expenses. I don't know, I'm not, are you good at business? Can you, is that good or bad? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> so, so Steve says to me, he says, you know, you have all the money you need. Yeah. Why are you wasting your time with this business? It's clearly a failure. I said, well, I think it's going to be okay, Steve. And Who is Steve? Steve, Steve Beauchamp, the, the, oh, yeah, the yeah, co-CEO. Yeah, 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 so yes, yes, the CEO. I, I just have a feeling it's going to be okay. And sometimes you also have intuition. And I could see where the industry was going to go. I could see we're going to be more of a global economy. Um, as a Baha'i, that kind of fits my spiritual values as well, that you know everyone in the world is a, is a global citizen. And there's no reason in the long run. Companies are going to come to Kenya from America and probably do already and hire Kenyans who are just as good or better than their American employees, or Uganda, or places in Africa. I think there's going to be more and more of that in the future. And by the way, vice versa, Kenyan companies saying, hey, I want to employ wherever, in Uganda and America. I think more and more of us will consider ourselves world citizens. And so global payroll is very important. So I built this company up. After five years, it was an abject failure. Four years later, I sold it to Steve and Paylocity for $60 million. And uh, that's how they do global payroll now. What happened is the company, right from that point you told me to shut it down, took off like a rocket. And four years later, we were doing $20 million in revenue mm. as opposed to a million and a half. And we're, we were then getting to profitability. Mm -hmm. So we took this business, which was losing a lot of money and not growing, and it grew very quickly. So I was right to hold on to it. What is the biggest employee uh, that Pelosity runs, the biggest number? I actually don't know. But mm. I would say probably 10,000 employees, but I, I could be wrong. Mm. You could be wrong. <laughs> Somewhere in that range. Somewhere in that range. Oh, great. Uh, and then and then there is the... But the, the, the industry is really huge, right? Yes. Because there is the HR, uh, there is the... Time so, and attendance. Yeah. It's a big industry. It's everything with having to do with paying an employee. So there's a lot to doing that. And Paylocity does all of that. And, and I 
I'm actually very proud to say very well. I think we're the best mid-market payroll provider in the United States, if not the world. Mm. And we have been, I'll just, I'll brag about my company a little bit, although please I have- Please do, please do. Uh, we, we have been the fastest growing payroll provider, HR and payroll provider in the world, uh, publicly held for nine quarters running. So every year when we report our results, every quarter, we're the fastest growing uh, payroll and HR company for nine quarters running. Mm. It's interesting that I've realized that there are so many businesses that people don't know, but are very important in the business community, the business world. Um, we are going to go to uh, to your faith, but but still we are going to stay a little bit in this in this in the in the in the money in the money. Well, the, we should talk about movies. Movies, yes. Uh, but before we go we, before we go there, we there is something about money that we talked about. You told me that you are not a good what. Well, my friend told me I'm not a good rich man. He said, you're a, you're a terrible rich man. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, we've been friends for over a decade. You don't like me? He said, no, I like you just fine. You're just not good as being rich. And he says, well, you're supposed to have a yacht and belong to a country club and invite all your friends. He says, you don't do any of that. Yeah, that would be nice. I don't, have, <laughs> <laughs> I don't belong to a country club. I don't have a yacht. I don't have a fancy car. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're going to be with me, it's going to be simple. I mean, I, I do occasionally stay at nice hotels and I... Now I fly first class, which I didn't used to do, but I don't have a jet. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm lacking all the accoutrements that I'm supposed to have as a wealthy man. So he said, you know, look, you're fine. You're just not a very good rich man. To me, I would much rather, I remember, I'll tell you, there's one memory I have, which is always stick in my head. I was driving to work uh, one day in my, in my Prius. I don't think I bought my Prius yet. It was a Camry I had at the time. Yeah. I was driving in my old Camry. And this guy in front of me had a Lamborghini, which is probably worth about $150,000. Yeah. And I had just given away over a million dollars to my employees from the proceeds of the company going public. And I thought, well, with that, I could buy like seven Lamborghinis, mm. the money I'd given away that day. And I thought to myself, I would never change that decision. I'm never going to buy a single Lamborghini. Nothing against a Lamborghini. It's great, you know, for those who want to buy one. But to me, I would much rather share the wealth and that gives me more happy happiness. And my Camry, I liked my Camry, and I liked my Prius. Mm. There are guys who really like uh, showing the money they have, and some people say that it is it is it's problematic in the sense that it shows where they're coming from, uh, what their attitude is. It's just that they don't understand reality. So yeah. I'm going to go into my faith now. Spiritual reality is more important. We're all truly spiritual. You know, I'm I'm in Kenya here. You know, America has a terrible legacy of racism, and I'm sometimes ashamed to walk around with the color of my skin in America with what's been done to black people, brown people, Native Americans. But then I think to myself, I can change this. I can, I can help change this. If I can do my one little piece to help change this, I will do that. Going back to spirituality, spirituality does not know skin color. And what the truth is, the, the, the solution to racism is in our hearts, not our heads. We've done a lot of legislation in America to try to make things better and change it. But we, we have to change people's hearts, and we have to make people understand our true reality. I am not what you see. You can see me as a billionaire. I was saying to my friend uh, Blazy this morning, who took me here to Africa, I said, when people see me on the Internet, they think of me different than when they meet me in person. So it's a little surprising because, you know, billionaire, you know, whatever you want to say, the titles, that doesn't matter. What matters is who I am as a person. And I'm a simple person. I don't need fancy things. I don't really want fancy things. I'm happier just to go for a walk in the park with my friends than to go out to fancy places. That's just not who I am. And Some people say, if you can't, if you can't, why bother making money if you can't have a Lamborghini, bro? Well, it. The, the, the use of money should be for the service of the world. Everything should be the, for the... So my faith, I'm a Baha'i. The Baha'i faith is the world's newest religion. Um, every religion has an age. So there's one God. There's not a Muslim God or a Christian God or a Jewish God. There's one God. And in this age, God has sent Baha'u'llah as the prophet for the, the Lord of our age, the prophet for our age. And he said that we're all one humanity. And... How could I, as a wealthy man, it's in the Baha'i writings, be happy when someone right down the street, my brothers or sisters are poor? I can't. So my job is to help them, not by just giving money away, because that's not going to help them, actually, ironically. But it's to invest in things that change society to help everyone be lifted up. That's mm -hmm. the best way to do it. A Lamborghini doesn't do that. Now, I'm not against Lamborghinis. If someone wants to drive a Lamborghini, and actually, the Baha'i faith is not against Lamborghinis. If, the, if, if you 
are a very good and charitable person and you want to buy a Lamborghini, no problem. Because the things of the world should be enjoyed. We're, we're not ascetics here. In the Baha'i faith, we're not ascetics. And I, and I do enjoy sometimes nice things. I particularly like going to a nice restaurant occasionally. Um, I enjoy, I have a very expensive hotel. I have one expensive, well, we're at a nice hotel here in Kenya, which I like, the Kempinski. But my favorite hotel in the world is the Effendi. And if you're ever in Akko, Israel, that's my favorite hotel in the world. It's, I love it because it's so beautiful. I don't love it because it's expensive and fancy. I love it because it's got a beautiful spirit to it. It is beautiful, but to me, the greatest things in life have nothing to do with money. Mm. The, the, more money the more money we have, the more problems we see. Well, it, no, that's not necessarily true. The writings actually specify that it's very dangerous to be rich, and most rich people are kept from essentially heaven, closeness to God by their wealth. Their wealth becomes a barrier. But... In the case where the wealth doesn't become the barrier, it's a wonderful thing. Wealth is wonderful as long as it's used in the service of humanity. And I went on a three-year odyssey to make the gate, dawn of the Baha'i faith. Along the way, I met an amazing young Baha'i by the name of Justin Baldoni. He's an actor. He was in a very uh, popular show called Jane the Virgin. And he's also a very talented director. And he's also a very passionate Baha'i. And he and I became friendly. And... He came to me and he said, look, I'm trying to raise a million dollars for my business. I said, well, Justin, I've got some good news and some bad news. The, the bad news is I'm not going to help you with that. The good news is I want to become your partner. And I don't want to give you a million dollars. I actually want to buy the majority interest in your business and we'll become business partners. And then Justin, unlike most people, when a billionaire comes to you and says, I want to buy majority ownership in your business, started asking me all sorts of questions to make sure I was worthy to be his business partner. And in retrospect, he was probably right to do that because I think the world of Justin, and I and I, I thank God every day that maybe I'm worthy to be his partner. He's a he's a really a, a great business partner. I love him to death. And right now he's working very hard on a movie called It Ends with Us, which you're going to have in Kenya. It's going to be all around the world. And please go see it. It's scheduled to come out in the U.S. on June 21st, based on a best-selling book. Mm. Great. What other movies are you? Uh, what? Why the name Mayfair? Wayfair. So wayfarer is throughout the Baha'i writings. It's, a, it's someone who's going on a spiritual journey, the wayfarer. It's a traveler, but it's a spiritual journey, a spiritual okay. adventurer. So the wayfarer, and it's really um, about the search for truth, the journey for truth. And so we are wayfarers. We're all wayfarers. And the most important journey we have in our lives is for truth. And we should all be on that journey. And so Wayfair is taking us through films on that journey. And what we're showing is the nobility of every human being. We have my favorite movie we've made so far is called Code Three. Uh, it's got. Have you ever heard of Little Rel Howery? I don't know how much the, no. he's been. In, you probably have seen him if you've watched American movies. And Rain Wilson, he was in The Office, The American Office. Do you get that here? No. Okay, so he's he's very very popular in America. He's also a Baha'i, and so they play paramedics and. They, um, Rain is really the star, and he's just down. He's he's old, and he's cranky, and he's not in great health, and he's burnt out, and he's bitter, and he's lonely, and frustrated, and he hates his job, and he hates the world, and uh, he's the hero of the story. Mm -hmm. And I love showing someone like that. And it, really, the purpose of the movie is to to. It was written by a paramedic who had six of his friends commit suicide. I think it was six or twelve. I don't remember. But several of his friends actually committed suicide because the job is really hard and they're not paid a lot of money. And the movie, through it's a, it's a dark comedy, but it shows all the ridiculous situations they're put in. And yet it shows what I love is it shows the nobility of this paramedic who we ultimately end up falling. I do. I think almost everyone who watches the movie falls in love with Randy, the character that Rain's playing, and realizes that this very flawed human being who's cranky and you know, he's, he's, he's not your typical, he doesn't look like a superhero or act like a, you know, he's an older, Rain, Rain's my age, um, he's in his 50s, so here's a guy who's in his 50s, and you know, he's not the superstar, handsome superhero, mm. but yet he's trying to save lives every day, and I love the idea of putting that idea that every one of us is doing a job and every one of us is noble. Mm. Uh, we, uh, we have another movie called Ezra, which has, uh, it stars an autistic young man, and also, Ezra in the Bible? Um, no, the name of the boy is Ezra. And it actually starts, you've probably heard of Robert De Niro. He's so famous, yes. everyone knows him. Yeah. So he plays the grandfather in the movie. But it's, uh, it's really the father has a lot of problems. He kidnaps his son because he has a restraining order and takes him across America. 
uh, to, uh, he's going to be on a, a, a talk show by the name of Jimmy Kimmel, a very famous talk show in America, may, probably worldwide. Anyway, so again, very flawed characters, but you see this, the love between the father and the son and the grandfather and the father. And so we're showing nobility in people that might not necessarily be like the obvious choices. So not Hollywood, not typical Hollywood movies, but movies that are tending towards change. Yeah, uh, It Ends With Us is about a woman who's getting abused. And actually, Justin, who, if you knew him in real life, is the opposite of an abuser. He just He's gentle and kind and very sensitive for a man. He's a big, strong guy, but he's a very sensitive, lovely human being. But he plays an abuser. And the woman, who's played by Blake Lively, has to figure out, um, who's a fine actress, um, very well known as well. She's married to uh, Ryan Reynolds, who's very famous. Um, but anyway, she has to figure out, and she has to get this, what the book is about, she has to get the strength to, to leave this abuser. And it's really to encourage women to stand up and, and leave these abusive relationships. Mm. The movie business, is, us, is it as lucrative as? Not so far. I've lost a lot of money so far, but I, I think in the long run, um, mm. I will make money. Most movies lose money. I'm not in the movie business to make money. I'd like to make my money back uh, that I've put into it. I put over $100 million into it, so I'd like to make that back. But in the end of the day, I'm in the movie business for really one reason and one reason only, and that is to take the principles of the Baha'i faith, of the oneness of humanity, the nobility of every human being, and put them out there on a screen. You can do with a movie what you can't do with words. The, you know, they say a picture is a thousand words. So I'm in the movie business to spread love. You know, spread, my, this Be Love is actually love. from Wayfair. This is, this is a, a Wayfair slogan. That's a, that's a, that's a T-shirt from your, from your other company. From Wayfair Studios. Mm. Okay, let's talk about then the faith. Okay. You know, I consider myself a Christian, mm -hmm. a follower of Jesus Christ. So am I. Yeah. Sure. I, you, you can only follow him. Jesus Christ says in John 14, 6, I'm, I'm the way, the life, the truth, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Mm. But then he says in John 9, 5, he says, I'm the light of the world as long as I'm in the world. Mm. So the question is, what does that mean if you put the two together? The funny thing is that when we, when we talk about the Baha'i, the Buddha, I thought you'd quote from the, from, from the Baha'i Bible. But you're quoting from the Bible. I can quote from the Bible, I can quote from the Baha'i writings. You know, for example, Jesus says in the Bible, let him who is with, without sin cast the first stone. Very famous thing. Yes. Baha'u'llah, who is the return of Jesus, he's the return of Christ, he says, breathe not the sins of others so long as thou art thyself a sinner. So it's, a, it's Christ coming back again and giving us, so I'm a follower of Christ in whatever incarnation he has. So Baha'u'llah is just the, the, the newest incarnation of Christ. He was very clear when he came back. He said to Christians, he actually wrote a letter to the Christians of the world, and he said, don't make the same mistake the Pharisees made and reject me without reason. So in other words, the call is to, for every Christian to go read what Baha'u'llah wrote. Go study his life and decide for yourself, was he the return of Christ? Mm. Now, the Bible is very clear about the return of Christ. He's going to return as a thief in the night. And then in several verses, and I'll actually tell you which verses, it's um, Matthew 16, 27, Mark 8.38, Luke 9.26, Revelation 21.11, and Revelation 21.23. The Bible specifies he's going to come in the glory of God, the glory of my Father. Do you know what Baha'u'llah is in English? No. The glory of God. Oh, yeah, Blazy told me that. <laughs> so yeah. he, the Bible says I'm going to come as the glory of God and as a thief in the night. Do you know what that means? Mm, as a thief in the night when, nobody, when, 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 when almost everybody is unaware. Right. But he's there. The thief is very much there. And if you open your eyes, you can see him. My faith sees the humanity in every human being. Yeah. I, I, I see you, and I see your eyes, and I see your soul. And we have to see people like that. What the Baha'i faith is, is about the unity of humanity. Now, take a, take a quick step and breathe, and think of a world where it didn't matter what your skin color was. It doesn't matter what country you come from. It doesn't matter what religion you were raised. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. Everyone is noble, and everyone is equal. This is the message of Baha'u'llah. How could we turn away from that? Mm. Uh, the last time I spoke with Blaze, he told me a very interesting story of how he ended up being, uh, getting into the faith. What was your spirituality like when you were growing up, and how did you end up into, you know, having that awareness that you recommend? That I have you always been like this? 
Is no, it? no. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> I was raised a uh, Reformed Jew, um, so very kind of a liberal branch of Judaism, um, not, a, not a very strict. We went to temple about three times a year. I always believed in God. The reason I believed in God my whole life is when I was six months old, my mother had a life after death experience. Her appendix burst, she almost died. She was pronounced dead on the operating table. And then the surgeon who actually almost killed her uh, valiantly rescued her life. And she's still there. She's still here with us uh, 58 years later. She's, uh, I would have never known my mother, who's wonderful. So, um, But I, she said she talked to God. So in her life after death experience, she saw a, a bright light and that light showed her flashbacks of her life and asked her if she wanted to move on to the next world or stay in this one. And she had a six-month-old baby boy, a two-and-a-half-year-old baby girl, and a husband who was a, 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 a like just puddles of tears in, 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 in the other room because he couldn't live without her. Uh, he was probably in his late 20s at the time. He's now 86. And so uh, I always believed in God, but I didn't really understand how religion could be a big part of my life. I was spiritual but not religious. When I discovered the Baha'i faith, it was gradual. I wasn't looking for anything. Um, a lot of people who are looking for things find the faith much faster. I kind of casually was just a curious, I was intellectually curious. And over time, that intellectual curiosity led to a spiritual transformation. When I realized, and why I became so passionate about the Baha'i faith is I realized that it's so necessary. You look at the war right now in Israel and Palestine and people killing each other because you're, you follow this God, and I, I follow, it's the same God. There's not a Muslim God and a Jewish God. And when I want to kill someone because I think that they're the oppressor and I'm the oppressed, you shouldn't want to kill anybody. You know, the Baha'is are persecuted. You know, I, I've heard people say that the, the massacre of Jews on October 7th was justified because Palestinians are persecuted. There's nothing to compare with the persecution of Baha'is in Iran, and yet Baha'is have not raised a finger to, to defend themselves in, in over 175 years. We don't need to have war anymore. We need to have peace. Persecution of anybody is wrong. Killing someone because you're persecuted is also wrong. We must start to learn and love each other and see our, ourselves as one. And this, this message is needed all across the world. We need it in Kenya. We need it in America. We, we just, Blasey and I just went to Uganda. We need it there. We need this message of oneness. And when we understand what we're one, then we can solve our problems. It is very, uh, one of the things that I, I was really struggling with when I was speaking with Blaise about the Baha'i faith is uh, calling yourself a Baha'i and also calling yourself a Christian. Can a Muslim call themselves a Baha'i? Here's what I say. I'm yeah. Jewish as long as I can also be Christian. And I'm Christian as long as I can also be Muslim. And I'm Muslim as long as I can also be a Baha'i. Now, Muslims won't let me also call myself a Baha'i. A Christian couldn't also be a Muslim, and a Jew couldn't also be a Christian. So I'm, I'm none of those faiths because they block me. As a Jew, I can't recognize Jesus. As a Christian, I can't recognize Muhammad. As a Muslim, I can't recognize Baha'u'llah. But as a Baha'i, I see all of them as true. And so I am not a Christian in the sense that I don't reject Muhammad and Baha'u'llah. But I am a Christian in the sense that I love Jesus and I love the Bible. And as you can tell, I've read the Bible once or twice. Oh, yeah. Not once or twice. <laughs> I saw you talking about, I mean, what is the, the last one, the Revelation? Ah, oh, you quoted them so efficiently. Yeah, so Revelation, um, actually, uh, my favorite, I read, I, I've, I've studied the Bible for over 30 years. And I did not understand the book of Revelation. And there's this amazing book by Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, called Some Answered Questions. And in, in, in one chapter, it goes through the 11th chapter of Revelation. Actually, it goes through the 12th chapter as well. But that one chapter changed my life, at least in my view of Revelation. And all of a sudden, what was, was just murky, and I didn't understand it, all of a sudden, it was clear as day. Because he goes through word by word and says what it means. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what it means. And then I could apply that logic to the rest of Revelation to some extent. And now Revelation makes a lot of sense to me. Like the biblical beast. You know, I don't know if you had this in Kenya. We had this uh, superstition in America that when you get a COVID shot, you would, you would, it would give you a chip and control you. Did you have that? Yes, 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 yes. It was in, on the internet. Everybody saw it. Um, do you know what it means? No. So it has to do with Revelation 13, 16, 17, and 18. And what that says is that the beast... The mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, yes. It says that 
you'll need a mark on your right hand or your forehead in order to buy or sell. And the number of the, the beast is a man. The number of the beast is 666. Yes. So the, before COVID happened, that had uh, evolved, kind of morphed into the idea of a chip being put in your forehead or your hand. And that was before the COVID shot. And when the COVID, so, and it was the beast, it was the Antichrist that was going to do it. And so when COVID happened, they changed it to the shot. Well, the beast actually did come, just like the Bible said. So I, I want to say I'm not superstitious, but I believe in the biblical beast because I read some answered questions. And so what happens is the, the beast comes in the 660s, very interestingly, as the Umayyads. So the beast kills the two witnesses. Going back a couple chapters in the Bible, the beast will come and kill the two witnesses. The, the two witnesses will reign for 1260 days, and the beast also reigns for 1260. 1260s in, the, in their uh, actually 10 times in the Bible. You see, if you were a Christian and you went in Jerusalem in the year 666, you would get a mark on your right hand in order that you buy or sell. It actually happened. So I believe in it because it actually happened. It happened? Of course it happened. When? In 666. What is 666? In the 600s, the Umayyads. So what the Umayyads did is they killed Ali, the chosen successor of Muhammad, and they took Islam into a darker direction. So that was the biblical beast. So it says in the Bible that they'll kill the witnesses, or the beast will kill the witness. Well, that's what happened. Ali was killed by the Umayyads, who took power and took Islam to a more material, less spiritual direction. And the mark was put on by the Umayyads. The Umayyads put a mark. It was a tattoo. If you look, if you research it, there's an ancient Christian uh, tradition of tattoos in Jerusalem. And that's where it comes from. Where can I read that? Where, where can I read I'll give you an article when we're done with the podcast. I'll show you in the article. Mm -hmm. And it's on your lower right wrist, your right hand, just like the Bible says. What I'm telling you is it's the superstition yeah. about the COVID shot is silly. But it actually happened. The 1260, I want to talk about the but, 1260. Uh -huh. But if it happened, then it can't be silly anymore. Of course, it, it's not. It's not silly. It just happened. <laughs> you know, what yeah. I say, it's very scary, but it happened 1400 years ago. So I'm not so scared. Mm. The, the 1260, which is repeated in 10 separate verses in the Bible, is all talking about the advent of the Baha'i faith. The advent of the Baha'i faith happened in 1260, which is the Christian year 1844, when the Bab declared. So the Bible is telling you over and over again to look to the year 1260. Two witnesses will reign for 1260 days or 42 months. So the two witnesses are Muhammad and Ali. It's really what's this is the amazing thing about the Bible. It's talking about the coming of Islam, which we know came, and then it's talking about the coming of the Baha'i faith, which we know came. Mm. And in 1844, the promised one of Islam, the Bab, declares, and then the Muslims are waiting for him to herald the return of Christ. That's Baha'u'llah. Mm. And then there's so many things that have happened that are also in the Bible, like the return of the Jews. Um, that's, uh, that's Isaiah, I think it's 11, 11, 11, 12. Isaiah, it says, on that day I will reach out my hand a second time and gathered my scattered remains, and it lists all the countries. Well, that happened. Mm. So it's already happened. The Jews have already come back to the Holy Land. It's predicted in the Bible. But who's going to gather them? Of course, the Messiah. The Messiah is Baha'u'llah, and he's buried there. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, the first time I heard about the faith, uh, Baha'u'llah faith, is when Blazy told me about it. Uh, you don't go knocking doors, you know. No. We have come with the good news. Yes. We tell people about the good news. But, you know, the good news, the gospel, in, in Christ's day was the, the message that he'd come. Now it's that Baha'u'llah's come. The gospel, good, good news, is applying, it's implying something new. The news is that Christ has returned. Christ has returned with love for all humanity. That's good news. But we just tell people. Blazy and I will tell people about our faith. And actually, during this trip, uh, Blazy's friend just became a Baha'i. And so it becomes one person at a time. Mm. It's one person, one heart at a time. And that's how we spread the faith. We well, don't tell or perhaps you just have a good heart and walk around with a good heart and good friendship. And some, some, somebody would ask, where do you get, where, you, where your heart so good? And you'll tell them, I faith. That's the best way. You, you to do don't it. have a TV series where you talk about Baha'i. You don't. You don't have a, a podcast where you talk about Baha'i. That's the best. Well, we do all of that. Um, you know, we 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 talk about it. Um, I'm actually helping Rain Wilson with his book Soul Boom. We're, we're, I'm actually partnering with him 
to do a podcast in. But that's more of a general, uh, uh, it's a podcast about faith, but everyone knows Rain is a Baha'i. So yeah, we talk about our faith. But as Baha'is, you're a Christian. I don't care if you're a Christian or a Baha'i. Are you a good man? That's what I ask. Are you a good man? Do you, are you a follower of Christ? Because if you're a follower of Christ, that's all I care about. What is a good man to you? Do you are you loving? Are you kind? Are you honest? Are you patient? Are you compassionate? Are you merciful? Mm. These things know no religion. They're all religions. Every manifestation, every messenger of God taught those same spiritual virtues. So a true follower of Christ, and by the way, the person who taught me the Christian faith, I have a, a friend, Pastor Kevin, who's been, I've been reading the Bible with him for 30 years. That's how I came to know the Bible. He's a good Christian. And he said to me one day, I didn't even try to teach him the Baha'i faith. Of course, he knows I'm a Baha'i. He said, you know, I, I like the Baha'i faith, and I would probably become a Baha'i, except I love Christ too much. And I haven't told him yet that if he loves Christ a little bit more, he can become a Baha'i, because as a Baha'i, you can love Christ twice. But we don't love Jesus any less. We just love Jesus and Baha'u'llah. And so, to me, if someone's a good Christian, they're already a good Baha'i. If they're a good Muslim, they're already a good Baha'i. If they're a good Jew, my, my mother and my daughter are two of my favorite people in the world. They're both angels on earth, as far as I'm concerned. They're Jewish, but they're good Jews. And not even but, they are good Jews. They're a good example, and they'd be good Christians if they were Christian, and they'd be wonderful Baha'is. But that's their choice. An atheist? A Baha'i? Does that work? Yeah, well, let me tell you about atheism. Yes. I don't believe in the same God that they don't believe in. Most atheists aren't atheists because they reject God. They reject the version of God they've been shown. And I reject that same version of God, a God which is harshly intolerant, judgmental, that is full of hate and war and conflict, um, a God that goes against logic, reason, and proven science. I reject that God, the same God they reject. But I love, love, I believe in love and kindness and mercy and compassion, truth and justice, all the divine virtues. You see, that's God to me. God is not all those terrible things that sometimes we see in the name of religion. I think, and it depends on the atheist, there's a whole variety of atheists, just like there's a whole variety of Christians and, and believers and, and Muslims and all peop faith people, but I think many people originally become atheists because they reject the falseness that they see in the name of religion. They see Christians who aren't true Christians or Baha'is who aren't true Baha'is, or whatever religion that someone's not following properly. And I, so I guess what I'm saying about an atheist is I actually don't think they reject God as much as they reject falseness in the name of God. And, and they haven't come to the conclusion yet that there might be true religion, that religion might not be a good, that could be a good thing. And of course, I've seen religion be a great thing. Today we have very, what I would call very dramatic kind of evangelism, very fiery the people in the pulpit with thousands of people following along, uh, a lot of giving, a lot of do this, and the God, and God will, you like, very transactional. If you give more, God will give you more. If you do this, God will do. Like, sometimes it feels like harassment of the people. What What do you think about it? It's I see a lot in the United States, It's but it's perhaps even worse here in Africa. Uh, did you watch the BBC on the, the BBC documentary that came out the other day that is trending all over the world? What is it? T.B. Joshua. Oh, is it about? It was about crazy things going on in that church. Uh, I mean, rape, uh, all oh, these yeah. crazy, oh, crazy yeah. things. So, yeah. so, so here, here's what, what I would say. What, yeah. I, I would say that we should be followers of Christ and his message. And his message is not about a very, I'm a very wealthy person, but I mean, a very wealthy evangelist saying, give me more money so I can fly in a nice jet. That makes no sense. You know, Christ himself um, and actually, the Baha'i writings talk about this. Abdul Baha talks about the great wealth of the popes, actually, historically, even to this day, in the name of Christ. It makes no sense. Um, we should not be accumulating wealth in the name of Jesus, who said, give your wealth to the poor. He says, when a rich man comes to Jesus, he says, what to do? He says, give, go ahead and give your, all your money away, and the man couldn't do it, because he was too attached to his money. It makes no sense. If we read the Bible, what these people are preaching makes no sense. And, and the other thing is we should never be concerned about going to hell that way. If you give me money... <laughs> we should, we should well, never you know, be concerned well, about you know what, going to hell that well, way. We should do, Which way? <laughs> we should do good things according to the Baha'i faith for the love of God, not for the hope of heaven or the fear of hell, but we should do good things. We should focus everything on loving God. Christ's message, he said the two most important commandments were loving God and loving humanity. The, you know, love your neighbor, the golden rule. Let's focus on that. Let's make that... If we made that the focus of what we do. These preachers would all 
basically be impoverished or go find another job, which would be great because <laughs> I don't think they add much value to society. Mm? I, don't, I don't think someone who's becoming very wealthy with thousands of followers and this very transactional way of looking at religion is a, is a good way to go. I think religion should be at the service of society. So and what I mean by that is religion should be for the individual and collective um, salvation of society. So religion should be applied and it is going to be applied to help everybody. So the Baha'i faith is designed to help solve societal problems. That's what religion, that's the focus. The focus is not on, on going to heaven, or shouldn't be, on going to heaven or staying out of hell. The focus should be, how do I help my neighbor? How do I help the world? Mm. That's religion. Somebody asked, how do you, as a, what is, what, what, is your, what is your way of life? Like, what do you do during the day? How do you wake up to, what time do you go? You well, a lot of nice. times I do 14-hour days, 12, 14-hour days, where I just don't stop. Um, I, 14 I'm, hours? Yeah, 12, 14-hour days. I don't really work anymore. I go, I go appointment to appointment. I try to take a couple breaks during the day. Otherwise, I get too tired because I'm getting old now. But I, I, um, I spend probably, you know, my favorite thing to do is probably, you can tell, is to teach the Baha'i faith. And I do that whenever I can. It's my favorite thing to do in life. My second favorite thing to do is philanthropy. My third thing I probably do in that order is uh, work on the businesses, the movies, et cetera. So that's what I do every day. I'm busy doing different things every day. Um, I work on my foundation. I, we, we're giving uh, our foundation as a budget of $40 million, the, the Baha'i-inspired foundation this year. The um, other foundations, our family foundation, about $10 million. And so we're giving away money, and that takes effort to do it correctly. Um, but... Yeah, just I have a lot of different balls in the air, different businesses I've invested in. Um, and then the faith itself. I serve the faith. I, I We have something called Firesides. I do those whenever I can. I have one I'm doing on Sunday, actually out of the UK. Um, so it basically, you know, almost like our interview, talking about the Baha'i faith, various aspects of it. Um, I, I guess what, if you had to sum it up, I try to serve society. So um, you'd say you wake up at five, four? I wake up probably around six or seven in the morning. I, I run. I try to run, and uh, at least a few days a week. Been a runner for forty six years, and then I um, I work out with a trainer a couple times a week, mm -hmm. and the rest of my time is hopefully dedicated in service. You know, so obviously I sometimes go out with friends and family, um, but most of my life is dedicated to trying to make the world a better place, whether it be through movies or philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Social media. What do you think about social media? Um, it's a tool. Especially, a lot of people are in social media. It's a tool. I saw you posting a little bit on LinkedIn, very mm -hmm. sparsely, not a lot. But there are people today that are living on social media. I post something. Well, if you go, go back on LinkedIn and also, I post more on Facebook. But what I post is I always try to post positive things, unifying things. I post for my movie theater. I also opened a movie, a movie theater up, too. Um, but my thought is social media is a tool, and it can be used for bad or good. And the world is struggling right now. The world, one thing I didn't say is we have a dual process in the Baha'i faith of disintegration and integration. And this old world order, which is based on things like racism and sexism and nationalism and division and, gr and greed and corruption and superstition, is dying very quickly. Our educational systems, our government systems are, are really not working very well. I know we have problems in the U.S. I've heard a rumor that government isn't perfect here in Kenya. And... So I, I think, but, but what's happening is as these old systems are dying, new systems are arising. And so I put all my energy into getting the, that information out there for people to, to embrace it. Okay. Um, the, yeah, this, this question, I think we had, we, had, we had talked about it, how to scale a business. I think we talked about that. Uh, the best financial advice you've ever received from somebody my accountant told me, hold on to equity on your business. Uh, be very careful, because it's very tempting when you have this new business, which is worth nothing. I'll just pay you an equity, because you don't have to pay in cash. But he said, hold on to your equity, which is why when the business went public, I owned 51%, which is why I'm, I'm a billionaire, because I was very uh, stingy with equity. Um, interestingly enough, as a Baha'i, I would be less stingy with equity. I, I might not be a billionaire. So it just God wanted the timing when he wanted the timing, in my opinion. But I, I would say that, you know, if you're a young, if you're starting a, a new business, try to hold on to your equity if you can. That's where the value is. If you truly believe in your business, mm. somebody's asking uh, if you, uh, when you are a, when you're a billion billion dollar rich person, does that mean you have the cash, 
or you just have? That's an excellent question. I do not have the cash. And in fact, this year I'm a little tight on cash. So I've had to tell many people I can't invest, I can't do this. In fact, in 2024, I'm basically doing no investments because I don't have the cash. Um, most of my money is in stock, which is illiquid. And I, I can't actually sell it whenever I want. What I have to do is a special plan that I sell it quarterly. And the stock price has gone down. So we actually have a minimum price, which we'd sell at. So I, I might be very tight on cash this year. I mean, I'll make it. I'm not going to starve. You don't have to send in any money. But I'm not cash rich. Mm. What's the difference? So the difference is that if you're not, if you're, you could be having the billions, but it is tied on the stocks. Most of my money is, is in the Paylocity stock, and it's not readily available. I can't borrow against it, and I can't. I can sell it, but uh, like I said, we have a plan to sell it, and the stock price just went down quite a bit. So our price to sell at is, it, it's. B- bottom line is, I may not be selling much stock this year, which is fine with me. I'll, we'll survive. This is my question. Uh, you told me that uh, you're not going to leave a whole lot of money to your kids. Correct. You know, uh, they're not going to be wealthy if they have to make their own wealth, if they're going to be wealthy. What is what is the rationale behind that? Um, Warren Buffett said, and I think it might have been someone else, give your kids enough money to do anything they want, but not give them so much money that they don't have to do anything. And that's kind of where we've tried to stay with our kids. Our kids, we've taken g- good care of them. We paid for their college. Um, they ha- each have a house. Um, they have some money coming to them when they turn 40. They're not going to be poor. When they turn 40? When they turn 40. They're 21 now. But they're never going to... Why wait for that loan? Well, Should give them at 25. No. <laughs> they need to, to work and to, to go through a process. As a human being, the, the journey is so much more important. They need to have the opportunity to find who they are and, and, to, and to earn their own money and to go through the process of, of worrying about money occasionally and to support themselves. These are things that are natural for a human being. And it's a lot more, especially for my son, I want him to have the pride of, of making his own money and supporting himself. I don't want him to, to go home at night and saying, I'm only rich because my daddy was rich. That's not, you know, we're not designed that way. We're designed to actually make it our own way. So they'll be okay. They're not going to be, bil- they, if they're going to be billionaires, it's going to be by making it on their own. I don't really like inherited wealth. I think that we should all, and I don't think you should hoard money. There's no reason for it. This, the other question. Uh, you are into tech, and we have AI with us. Uh, how do you think that it is going to affect the way we do business? AI, like any other new technology, is going to affect us in ways we don't know. But it's not this evil dragon that's going to kill everything, like some people say. It's a tool which will be used for good, and it'll be used for bad, and we'll figure it out just like we figured out the internet. Mm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think that is, is there anything you want to add? So, you know, I, I want to add one thing. I, I said it before, but I just want to say to the people of Kenya how much I love you. I really, everyone I've met in Kenya, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for having me. Um, I love you. I hope to come back to Kenya again. I, to every American who's listening to this or anyone from any other country, visit Kenya. It is such a wonderful, wonderful place. Kenyans are amazing people, and I'm so glad that my friend Blazy took me here. So that's it. Thank you for having me. All right. I also want to thank you very much for honoring my request to come to this interview. It's amazing. I think I have not uh, interviewed a millionaire here on this table. <laughs> I haven't. You know, and uh, you know, and now I have a, I have, I have talked with a billionaire, and the nuggets of wisdom that you've given, it's amazing. You know, I'm a billionaire. That's a coincidence. I think we should stop labeling. I'm a white man. I'm a tall man. I'm, you know, mm. I'm a, I'm a Baha'i. I'm a Christian. You know what? You, you're, you're now my friend. We're sitting across the table. Yeah. Let's get rid of all the labels. Yeah. I'm here. The billion is, and two billion is only there to help the world. Mm. And if I think it's anything else, if I think I'm better than you in any way, shape, or form because of that, then I have made an error. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I wish you the best, especially for your films, for, for in your film business, uh, in the tech business, which is uh, Pelocity, and in your philanthropy world, you know? Why you, why, what were you, you are coming here to do what exactly, by the way? I just came to see the Baha'i Temple. And, oh. and the, the one in Uganda and the one in Kenya. And Blazy took me. We went um, to three places one day. One was in Karen. Now, I have to say this. It's in, in, in the United States, 
The word Karen is a swear word. Did you know that? No. So you call a white woman who acu- basically she's a white woman who calls police on black men. She sees a black man and she calls the police. And so she's she's like an evil white witch in the United States. And so I go to Karen, named after a white woman. It's like, wow, <laughs> talk about ironic. <laughs> and then people love this Karen, and she was white. So it's really funny to me. But we, we had this beautiful uh, meeting in Karen with actually the mother. Uh, it was ironic that Blazy didn't know this when we came here. The woman that we went to visit, Blazy lived with her, and she was very inspirational in, in her, his faith journey. And she's actually the mother of one of my friends. So Blazy was going to introduce us, and she gave me a hug and said, "Steve, you're here." She, Blazy had no idea I had a connection. And then we went to a, a, we went to like a rich place. We were Baha'is met, and it was wonderful. And we prayed. We went to a, a kind of a middle class, beautiful place where Baha'is prayed. And we went to a poorer place. Uh, what's the name of that neighborhood, Blazy? Kabira. Yeah. So we went to Kabira, and we prayed there. And to me, it was wonderful to to see all the Baha'is. And we also went. My favorite one was out in the country, very far out in the villages. And I was laying down on the ground and a bunch of kids were feeling my hair because they'd never seen hair like this before. That was probably my favorite moment on the trip. So I just came here to meet the Baha'is of Kenya and Uganda, see the temples. That's all I wanted to do. I, I, we were supposed to go on safari this morning. I didn't do that. So mm-hmm. I haven't even gone on safari, which I guess is, I will next time I come. Yeah, amazing. I'm so glad that you love this place. I do, but the people are the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And I love the people. <laughs> so thank you very much people of the internet for tuning into Dialogues with Jagero. I hope that you enjoyed this episode Dialogues with Jagero. I would ask that you subscribe, leave a comment and a question hopefully uh, Mr. Steve can ask them at a later date if, if we see them so until another episode, bye for now <laughs>